All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for being here today. And I appreciate you taking the time just to have a kind of an informal chat at the end of the year about, you know, what all has happened, what might happen in the year ahead. And uh, we were just talking before we hit record that, uh, you know, what has happened when we first met, I think, two years ago and then, uh, you know, just a year ago. And even I remember we were talking last uh summer about stuff and uh things just seem to change so rapidly both for the good and for the bad and um so i appreciate you taking the time um so uh robert do you want to introduce yourself give just a little bit about, about your background i would be happy to um, my name is robert mallory i teach the blockchain certificate at ucla extension and prior to that i was a coder for a number of years and I taught the blockchain certificate at another uh, university here closer to the San Diego area. But primarily, I am a consultant. I help blockchain companies or emerging tech companies that are trying to get rolling with their companies and will do due diligence for family offices that are trying to dig into these things. So okay. I know code. I'm teaching it. And um, like yourself, very steeped in all of what's uh, being pushed out to the private marketplace in the world of tech. Well, um, you said you had a very busy December. Let's uh, talk about that December. Um, uh, what has happened since Thanksgiving? So on the heels of FTX going belly up, I did have a working relationship with Sam Bankman Freed. As a management consultant, if I see a problem in a platform or protocol, or some sort of a vulnerability in the code, I will send over an email to one of the leads of the project. And very often, if they don't have someone to fix part of it, they will have me do it myself. So that's a large part of my management consulting. But obviously with FTX, he had you know many hundreds of employees. So I would usually send over a suggestion. He would connect me with one of his leads of a different department, and we would talk about how something could be improved. So. When I saw that uh, Alameda was getting entangled in a public way and was going to bring down FTX and the whole interplay there, I reached out to Sam and said, it looks like you're doing an interview you know, here and there with industry and then with mainstream media. I just saw the one he did with George Stephanopoulos. And I'm like, why don't you do an interview with me too um, and pair it with a mainstream media? And at the end, he did four mainstream media and four industry media um, mostly through Twitter spaces for the main, for the industry media. But yeah, on the sixth, I interviewed him for 45 minutes. We asked 25 questions and then had a little Q and a, um, afterwards. And, um, since then I've been in regular contact with him since he's gotten back from New York. So, um, it's, it's quite a story and captured the world attention. Yeah. So, um, that's uh, yeah, it's so many different angles there. You know, I think when you first mentioned you're going to have this interview, I'm like, why hasn't somebody tackled him and, you know, told him to stay the hell away from technology and the phone. And now we're seeing that uh, the Alameda partner was probably talking to the feds. And so it may all come to rest on his shoulders as far as, uh, you know, he may never uh, see the light of day again. Right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, and uh, staying out of the, you know, whether we think that's, good or bad um uh that's just kind of the reality of the way uh things are going do you think that um you know there's been a lot of scams over this past year um coffeezilla on youtube is really good about it, exposing all these nft scams he just came out with a three-part series about logan paul's uh nft basically uh you know violating a lot of Federal Trade Commission rules about basically propping up a price and all these other things. And I think, um, you know, that's a, uh, is there like a bent, pent up kind of rage that's now focused on Sam because of this? Or, uh, you know, that would be, might be one argument for yeah, FTX or... has been an anchor for the whole industry. So a lot of projects that were doing well and had nice valuations got pulled down because everything's tied to Bitcoin. And then a lot of the short selling that would happen for FTT or all these assets 
um, would bring down all these other digital assets as well. So Sam has lost all of his friends in the, in the industry, certainly. And the fact that Gary Wang um, and Caroline Ellison have also cut a deal to give damning amounts of evidence against him and clarified exactly what happened is gonna make Sam's situation an uphill battle. Um, already it's the largest uh, bond that needed to have been posted. And on Neil Cavuto, they asked me, do I think exactly what you say, like he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. And I'm like, I'd be very surprised if he didn't. All right. So um, that's another thing that um, I want to get into in a little bit is about the whole aspect of regulation, because, um, boy, I remember first talking about this with uh, Andreas Anonopoulos, like in 2015. And, you know, uh, it was like my students were even raising the question, like, is this regulated? How should it be regulated? Is it a bank? You know, what is it? And of course, the US government has almost conflicting views on that sometimes, it seems, depending on what agency you're, you're talking with. Um, a, a year ago, we had uh, you know, uh, some senators talking about regulation, and we still see those same senators talking about regulation, but not much has really come about yet, uh, as far as I can tell. Can you give us your perspective on, uh, will 2023 be the year that crypto gets regulated? Seems like there's a lot of fight between the CFTC and the SEC. And SEC has far more employees that would be able to dig into this, but CFTC traditionally has better equipped employees, so they're more nimble. And the way forward on this, I think, will largely be around the, the Fed. Um, I know you do a lot with uh, central, central bank digital currencies, and uh, next month they're having a conference of the Philadelphia Fed out here in the San Diego area. And they're having representatives from Coinbase and Circle and Gemini, and they're all talking. But I think the government's trying to figure out what they want to do vis-a-vis -vis the central or the actual stable coins that have some sort of connection to keep the dollar strong. But on the overall landscape, I'm more bullish on institutional because of JP Morgan's Onyx program and then Goldman doing their first OTC deal for crypto. And yeah, a lot of these retail crypto projects are so entangled on the Howey test that it seems like if the SEC drops the hammer on Ethereum being a security, then everything else is going to fall under that umbrella too. Right. So there are, as you say, like a lot of people in Congress that are for it and say that um, you know, only 5% of the top 10, no, top 25 cryptocurrencies are domiciled in the US, whereas for internet companies, it's like 95%. So we're pushing a lot of these businesses offshore. And there's a better way to go about it, like Gemini has done, like um, Coinbase has done to handhold with regulators and build those ex expensive relationships and time consuming ones. But they're like, the rabbit and the hare, like they were sitting by as the tortoise while the, the hare of FTX just took all the attention and moved things so quickly. But now it's a survivalist bias where they're surviving, so they're doing um, quite well. But I think there will be clarity on this, but it won't be uh, in the way that people like because a lot of the DeFi that's institutional facing is on a permissioned blockchain. So they're just forking over the best of Aave and Compound and doing it under a walled garden. So from the looks of the institutional players, they're thinking that the hammer will drop and that the protections and innovations that will be happening will be facing accredited investors or qualified purchasers and the retail traders won't be able to continue to touch it. So I'm not very hopeful. And then the DAOs in Wyoming and Hawaii have limited protection. And then when they try to KYC AML, the people that have these tokens don't want to comply and give their information be known. So that makes banking difficult. And so mm -hmm. the clarity may happen on a statewide basis, but from the federal, it's not looking good. So that's the other thing is that we've gotten in the last uh, you know seven years to uh, this distributed type of 
people-based money, right? So coming from the people, uh, very uh, fitting with uh, a school of thought called Austrian economics, right? So that the, the people, the populace should determine the money, not some federal government um, distributed. Everybody's gonna have a little, you know, uh, minor in their basement and be part of this network to a highly concentrated, at least with a lot of coins, a highly concentrated system that is seen more as a speculative asset than any sort of currency. Um, <clears throat> the uh, is there a return to current cryptocurrency being currency or have we actually gone so far that we're not even considering that that's an application anymore? I think I've seen a lot of adoption of a Circles product USDC on Polygon, which can be transmitted for relatively uh, nothing. And also you have in, in emerging worlds, the Lightning Network that's being utilized and some platforms for merchants, they'll take a short position so that over a month they may say, whatever you get will market to this price, whether or not Bitcoin goes to 20,000, 2,000 you know, wherever up or down. So I think that its utility will be more on the back end. And I do think that it's, especially from the students that I see that are really attuned to it, the learning curve and the expectation of having everyone fire up a Web3 wallet or know their private keys, like that's a level of expectation that I think is unreasonable for the mass adoption people are expecting. It have to be much more like square, um, being able to scan a QR code and have the lightning transmission happen from there. But to your question about it being a functional currency, there's some attempts and it just comes down to the backing. Like I like MakerDAO using real world assets or real estate to back these things because that's ultimately what's backing the assets of a bank, like the right. mortgages themselves. So the, to the degree that they can mirror that and then um, have some sort of backing that's not requiring some algorithmic peg or something artificial, right. then I think mm -hmm. that has utility, but you don't want to step on any toes of the government that likes to keep um, demand for dollars high. Right. So um, I think that's an interesting observation as far as, um, you know, the, the backing, especially of these stable coins, because the we saw the failure of an algorithmic stable coin. Uh, that was a brilliant idea until it wasn't. Uh, and basically, uh, as far as I remember, kind of went to zero. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we have stress tests, right, for banks and institutions, you know, could you suffer if this, if this happened? So you could almost see the same sort of thing going for a stable coin. Can you stress test this? and show that you actually have the assets to back it up. Um, there's a, a question came in from uh, Pablo and he was um, wanting to talk a little bit about the implications of Ethereum being considered a security for staking and for apps running on it. And that's the other thing that was kind of big news this past year is Ethereum successfully went from a proof of work to a proof of stake. And um, once again, perhaps centralizing <laughs> uh, that currency, right? Because you're going to stake it somewhere. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I think staking is an interesting idea because you have people that are invested in the project. So they're disincentivized to make bad decisions. And I mean, just for people that are listening, like proof of work or using a miner or a computer to look and uh, try to secure the network by solving a mathematical problem. Proof of stake is where you have a proportional share of the project's tokens or cryptocurrency, and then staking that or um, pointing the tokens in a particular direction or um, securing them to a smart contract will give you power to have a vote on a proposal. And I think that the Ethereum situation is makes more sense because there are a lot of trusted actors that are leading this, you know, with Joe Lubin and Vitalik Buterin and, and all the guys from the Ethereum right. Foundation. And they're not without their problems in terms of the centralization. Sometimes with a DAO, even with a small percent, one or 2%, you can unilaterally vote through whatever you want. So you can 
use the treasury's resources as you see fit for even a few thousand dollars. So there's opportunities for manipulation there. And then with Ethereum itself, when you're staking these tokens as it stands now, there's no exact timetable for when you can unstake them. So a lot of people on Twitter are saying that it's a de facto burn for the Ethereum that you're putting on there. And that centralization of decision-making power in terms of when this, these tokens can be actively taken off the network is problematic because that's a platform that's worth many billions of dollars that the decision making over when you can unstake it could have a big market effect. So that's some insider information that could be massaged to the benefit of you know, various players that have a significant stake in the industry, like Consensus, which is owned by Joe Lubin and things. So all of the dynamics there amount to a lot of the same centralization as you may see on a governmental level. So I think you also make a good point about even the utilization of it. Like if you have a DAP that's using Ethereum, even if the DAP is reselling VPN services or cloud computing services, like completely vanilla technology products, if you've woven it into the Ethereum network, you could potentially have some problems there. So to the extent that these platforms can avoid any sort of overlap before this answer is being figured out stateside, it looks like people are. But around the world, there's no other game in town. There's no regulatory body that's looking over this they don't have a financial structure system um, as in places we take for granted here in the states so they don't worry about that but right. around town here they definitely do right well and you know it would be basically uh it would be considered very much in the same way that just the um crypto is right now it's considered a property so you pay long-term and short-term capital gains if it was considered um a security there would be some modifications, I would think, for example, right now you can still do what they call wash sales with crypto. So you can sell your Bitcoin right now at a loss, claim that loss on this year's taxes, and then tomorrow or a few seconds later, buy it back, right? So you can harvest that, do that loss harvesting in a way that you can't currently do with securities. And there's a number of other, other little <clears throat> weird weird doodads, I guess, in the IRS uh, laws, but it basically does come down to it being considered more like a, you know, property like a, a stock, but um, which is kind of the way the IRS treats it now. But um, the, uh, one of the things that, um, well, we've talked about central bank digital currencies. And as um, I kind of predicted about a year ago, that uh, we would see a push toward central bank digital currencies as a way to say, you don't need this crypto stuff, you can just use this. But it's been interesting to see how this has kind of played out because um, one of the big arguments for crypto is to help the unbanked, right? So we're gonna help people get into a financial system without um, the KYC hurdles, the know your customer hurdles, and those are not um, hurdles that are always um, obstacles because you uh, are doing something illegal or something. It's because, you know, I just got here from Afghanistan. I have about five to six Afghani students that just, I mean, it's pretty remarkable how well they're doing considering they just got here like seven months ago. Um, but, you know, you arrive here, uh, you're gonna, how are you gonna identify, you know, who you are or how are you going to, you know, be able to participate in this, or maybe your wife comes with you and, and maybe not all of her documentation is complete. So this idea of helping the unbanked, but now um, that, and it has been promoted kind of that way. So Nigeria has released a central bank digital currency, but they are having a hard, they thought this will be great because look at all these people using crypto. There's a natural market. Well, hardly anybody wants to use the Nigerian central bank digital currency. So um, I'm becoming more skeptical that we even really need this because I think uh, it's going to have a lot of the same barriers. And I just don't understand um, why we would want to give that much control over to the government. And maybe uh, maybe I have a little bit of a libertarian streak in me in, in that regard. But um, what, what are your thoughts on these central bank digital currencies? There's a lot of experimentation going. I mean, I like to read your newsletter to hear the latest on that, but just the, what they're doing with the sand dollar 
in the Bahamas, different countries that are trying to just build more of an adoption around their currency. I think um, Russia is really congealing around it and, and trying to do what they can to make settlement trades in rubles using some sort of arm's length cryptocurrency because for the longest time the chinese would use us dollars even in their settlement trades with russia but to the extent that russia can disintermediate the us they want to do that aggressively but yeah when i look around the world the ones that have done well um have some sort of link to the dollar or some sort of stability metric to them um and but as you say, it's all about adoption. And if the adoption is not there, then it's a worthwhile exercise or it's not a worthwhile exercise. Right. Well, the um, digital yuan, uh, yuan was going to re uh, release this year in China. They've been doing multiple experiments throughout the years to kind of get the, the kinks worked out. Um, must to the, I guess, alarm of many Western leaders, they actually encourage people that came to Beijing for the Olympics to use their digital currency. And all the uh, security folks that I uh, heard from were advising anybody that was going to Beijing to just buy a burner phone and throw it at, throw away at, at the airport on your way out of the country, um, <clears throat> because there was no way to tell, you know, what all was on it. Um, but uh, you know, with China, with the situations currently going on there, massive COVID uh, expected up to a million people will die. Um, we saw a lot of protests that were kind of, uh, you know, there's always some small protests in China, but with you know fairly large scale protests, it seems like that's a little bit dead in the water for now. Um, and uh, I think that the next step, if it had gone forward. Um, and maybe it'll go forward in 23, but uh, the next step would have been for them to start to use it with the people that they loan to. So China is a big lender to African countries, and um, they uh, it's unlike the IMF in that they will not require restructuring of the economy when they uh, restructure a loan or a debt agreement with a country. But I can see them saying, oh, well, you have to use our crypto or our central bank digital currency in order to, uh, you know, settle these trades now. Uh, but I think you're exactly right that so many countries use USD even when they have their own uh, currency because they use that as the de facto stable currency in the world. The UK has done a request for proposal with a, a large expenditure to start to research this. I think the newest prime minister is very bullish on crypto in general and that certainly the central bank digital currency angle, but it seems like a lot of innovation would be done in Europe by this. Like it's so, all these blockchain technologies are being so swiftly adopted in Germany and France and London um, thereabouts that they're moving forward pretty aggressively on this. Have you seen much in Europe that's been interesting? Um, you know, it's, it's, once again, there's a lot of research uh, being poured into this. I think their visa is doing a lot of work, both in the US as well as in Europe, on trying to be that um, payment service provider that's kind of in the middle that kind of holds the wallet. Um, and so you might, you know, have a currency that's almost, uh, well, like the, you know, we do today with your visa, when you charge something in a visa, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a basically, um, on Visa, not on the central bank, right? And then they aggregate these transactions eventually, but um, as being kind of the aggregator. Um, but uh, I don't know, it's very interesting because I think they're also very, very interested in privacy. And you, we see more privacy legislation coming out of Europe and um, what are the privacy implications? And they're also fairly large into consumer protection. And we see a lot of, once again, these scams where uh, you know if I can trick you into giving you and in, into giving me your private key, then uh, you know that's a uh, it's kind of game over, and uh, a lot of those scams are just to do that, right? It's not uh, it's not about trying to hack the the blockchain, which as far as I know has not ever been been hacked at least on a major cryptocurrency. Um, but I think. Um, uh, I think Europe's going to kind of put the brakes on it. Uh, also, the uh, head of GCHQ, their intelligence agency, has been fairly critical of uh, central bank digital currencies. 
The uh, other thing, not only to talk about Nigeria, but I was reading an article about electronic voting, and there's been several uh, votes. V O T Z is a comp not a company, but an organization here in the U.S. But it's started by Bradley Tusk, uh, the Tusk Foundation Philanthropies, and uh, they wanted to do blockchain voting, and they have done several experiments here in the U.S. with municipalities that have used blockchain voting often for overseas business, uh, overseas uh, servicemen and women, or people that are homebound. But um, their idea was that, well, if we had blockchain voting, there'd be more participation. But there really isn't, uh, that's an assumption, right? And so in Estonia, you actually have the ability with a smart, smart card to vote. You know, you have a little thing on your keyboard, you put your smart card in, you authenticate, you know, you basically digitally sign that this is Scott's and in his smart card. Uh, I actually have one of those because I'm an e-resident of Estonia and um, you, uh, I'm not a resident resident, so I can't vote. But if I was a, an Estonian resident, I'd be able to vote with that. Well, um, they found that there's no increase. <laughs> there's a shift. Some people will say, well, I'm not going down to the polls. I'll just do it from home, but there's really no increase in, in voting participation. So um, sometimes I wonder, you know, when we talk about these central bank digital currencies, once again, going out to this idea of helping the unbanked, um, are they really going to uh, in any way help this, or is it just going to make it more convenient for folks like you and I, who are already, you know, established in the banking system? With the Estonia thing, um, Caltech has a center that looks specifically at trying to help with voter fraud, and they watch the Estonia case very closely, and they were very hopeful when the first rollout happened that it would lead to a lot more adoption, and then they've been playing around with those cards in terms of how to secure it, so you can transmit something, but then when it's at the settlement layer, like how can you verify it, so uh, at least at the, when I talked to the director of their services for it's different applications here in the US. It's like you can, let's say you're voting and then you push it through and then you see that it's at the server and then it hashes a specific function and then you confirm that vote indicates um, the specific hash that you want. So it's all about uh, not allowing any sort of other entity to jump in the middle of a vote while it's being transmitted mm -hmm. or mess with the um, privacy layer that is supposed to disassociate the name of the voter with the actual right. vote as it gets um, encrypted in the process. So, but it, all these solutions, they take time to implement. But so as you say, like Estonia was a bellwether on that to the degree that voting is more secure. I think that's a win, but yeah, there's always going to be voting apathy, but that's, that's interesting that um, you have a real vantage point from that utility of it, because if at very least the blockchain is a good settlement layer for democracy, that's a pretty good use case. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, the, the votes thing, their application, I uh, talked with them and uh, they actually let me go in and see the audit where you could actually look, I think it was a vote in Arizona, so I could actually see you know, that the vote was cast, when it was cast, that it was a verified voter, uh, you know, a, a, an anonymized signature that tied in. So I could tell the person that voted, but you can tell how they voted, just like our current system uh, does. Um, but um, yeah, it's not clear that this in any way has any other benefit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would encourage anybody that, um, you know, is reading stuff online about our election system uh, and you're getting suspicious or something, uh, before you go down some rabbit hole, volunteer to be an election judge. Okay, I've done that. It's grueling. You get up at 3 a.m. and you're not done till 9 or 10 p.m. So take the next day off as well. Um, but it is grueling work and you understand exactly how this process goes by in every county needs election uh, poll workers. And as you go to the polls, you see that they're, you know, in their 70s and 80s, they could probably use, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, when I was poll working uh, this past year, you know, I brought the age down by at least 30 years, <laughs> and I'm in my 50s. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, but it's an important part of democracy, and you really get to see how 
you know, hey, this system with paper ballots here has kind of been worked out pretty well. Um, and yeah, you're exactly right. You know, how do we duplicate that on an electronic uh, format? And, you know, what benefit do we get by doing so? Um, is, is the big key there. Um, I wanted to bring up another topic here before um, we probably won't go too much longer, uh, but um, I was looking at an article that I wrote in 2021 in the kind of the height of the NFT craze and um, was talking about how NFTs were, um, you know, what they were and, and all that kind of good stuff and that the market cap for NFTs was 338 million in 2020. And if current, current trends continue, that will double or triple in 2021. I think 2021 was a pretty good year, but uh, in the first quarter of this year was pretty good. But then we kind of saw the collapse of NFTs as investment, um, as um, memorabilia. Um, we still had some significant NFT sales around fundraising for Ukraine and, and other places like that. What are your perspectives on NFTs nowadays, Robert? Most of the people that sign up for my classes do so to do something with NFTs. And most of them are trying to do something in entertainment or um, some utility out here. Uh, this is where Autograph is based, so Tom Brady's platform. And I think that the increasingly people are positioning these as digital assets or digital collectibles, the NFT narrative um, isn't as strong. So they're e even in the process now of reframing it, but I think that it's an interesting angle in terms of being able to own art or something that has utility, get backstage to a conference without having to have storage fees or being able to um, transact in the valuables associated with a project or a person relatively seamlessly. And I like that it's being used by, you know, Coinbase or different platforms that you don't have to get your nails dirty with a Web3 wallet as, well, as much. It's easy to transact in it, but it comes down to there's some problems with uh, ultimately the storage of, you know, the media. It's pointed to an IPFS file and that can actively be um, taken down or manipulated, um, you know, if you don't pay the storage fee on Pinata or all sorts of uh, different ways. And I think that there's people that are doing it the right way and the wrong way. And then when it comes to the volume numbers you're talking about, that's very easy to manipulate. And even if you do have a bunch of wallets that are just trading among themselves to create that volume, even if it's squeaky clean, you'll also see that people will buy and sell just a particular NFT. So you may buy an NFT thinking that, you know, I'm going to buy it at 0.1 Ethereum and now the floor is 0.5. You know, but they may be buying just a particular one. So, and then there's all sorts of these uh, meta characteristics that make some rarer than others, but there's an interesting play when it comes to provenance. So if it's owned by Mark Cuban, then it may have more value when it does go to Sotheby's or Christie's for their digital asset sale. And I've been really interested about the way that the traditional auction houses that have been around for hundreds of years have rallied around it because there's so much money there with the Beeple sale, with the Board Ape Yacht Club and these brands, because that's real money and those can be financed so you can buy a lot for a little. So that's an interesting dynamic, but at the end of the day, all these communities have very little moat because it takes very little technical understanding to mint an NFT, especially with OpenSea. So it's who's the project leads, who's trying to weave the community. Right. And from the extent that I've saw so far, it's just kind of fringe celebrities. But if it gets built out more by Disney, by established brands, it, it could be um, pretty promising. Well, one of the things that uh, has changed in college sports is the name, image, and likeness rules that have uh, changed dramatically from the NCAA. And so now my foot, the students that are here that are football students or track stars or softball uh, stars or javelin throwers can actually profit off their name, image, and likeness. Now, they can't wear a Mizzou you know, official t-shirt, they might be able to get away with just this color, right? And some black and gold coloring that might hint at Mizzou's colors. Uh, they would probably have a hard time uh, 
you know, the Mizzou would have a hard time going after them for that. But um, they're able to, uh, you know, make money from that. So um, it's very interesting if you think about, uh, now I don't, <clears throat> you know, if we had a basketball uh, freshman and you bought an NFT, you know, as a faculty member, I bought an NFT from that freshman, uh, and he goes on to be the next Michael Jordan. Well, once again, it's that, you know, I bought it when he was a freshman, right? When, when was the, the blockchain shows that Scott bought it when, you know, that uh, September of the year he uh, entered college. So um, there's some interesting things with NFTs. I, I'm, uh, you know, Ethereum and NFTs, uh, I'm kind of bullish on on the long term because I just think there's so much utility there. Um, another topic I talk a lot about is deep fakes and about how do you uh, ensure, you know, that this has not been tampered with. Well, that kind of, you know, I took a picture or made this video. We're going to create a hash of it. We're going to create an NFT based on that hash. Well, now you have a place that you can say this is the official Zoom recording. Um, and so we know that uh, what was said in it is uh, accurate, right? So I think there's all sorts of other um, things that go along with that. And I do think that, uh, especially my colleagues in information security, they've already gone to what they call zero trust, right? And, uh, you know, I, you have to prove it, you know, prove that this is correct. I'm not going to believe it until it's proven. And same sort of thing. I think we're going to have to start doing that with audio files and video files. These deep fakes are getting so good, you know, and even phone calls. You're going to have to prove, I'm not going to just believe it says Robert calling, Robert's going to have to prove this some, through some sort of cryptographic signature that this is, in fact, Robert calling. Um, and so the even the FCC is looking at this for spam calling and, and all these scams that go on via, via phone. Um, how can we use this technology to... Um, you know, authenticate uh, people, not just not just NFTs, obviously, but lots of other cryptographic uh, means as well. There's a software called Descript, which is a podcast software. And for $30 a month, you give it 10 minutes of text. And then I was able to put an article in and it used my voice to dictate a podcast that was word perfect, hit Ethereum, hit all of the technical terms, uh, you know, as with this better precision that I would be able to out of my own mouth. So it's, it's unbelievably scary and it's here. Yeah. The, uh, I did that and made a deep, I altered my voice and had it say that, um, I hate hedgehogs. I hate hedgehogs and play that for my students. And, um, you know, it's not perfect, but, um, it's good enough. You can tell it's, it's, uh, me saying that. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. The uh, well, let's talk a little bit about AI. You've been writing about that with GPT chat. So we're here at the December 28th in 2023. Um, we have seen in the last month this uh, basically uh, it's kind of been made available to the public, this G GPT chat. Um, and tell us what that does. What does it do? It does a great job of allowing you to use natural language processing to communicate with it, which is essentially a search uh, bot. So you're doing a chat bot and you're putting in specific queries. The most exciting parts of it are, are one, you don't have to look at the ads that you ordinarily might on Google or mess with the possible phishing sites. You're getting the direct answers, but it's more than giving you a specific answer for your specific query. It can uh, act as a no-code platform, so you specify what you want the computer program to be in, what language, and then when you get it, you can debug it with the help of it based on the error message that we were given by your remixer. Uh, now you probably saw they rolled out the 3D rendering based on specifications, and it, the composition, yeah, being able to do a poem or a long-form written article around a set of parameters is really compelling. Because you said it 100%, like when we talked on the interview, when I interviewed you two years ago, this, the compositions was largely garbage for these types of applications. So the investment, I think Microsoft gave OpenAI a billion dollars and they're, they're really doubling down on making these engines really good and they're getting better by the day. So the narrative from a lot of the VCs out here is that you can take down composition time. Editing can be more aggressively done, even more than like Grammarly, like um, 
you know, really honing in on what a beta reader might introduce. And then you can focus more on what you're trying to say rather than how you're trying to say it. And the applicability of it learning over time too, based on commands is interesting because it won't have to, you know, get smarter over time. And then also acts as a computer language. So you can create folders based on queries. And so it's roundly a very impressive platform. And there's little surprise that they got a billion users in five days. And then um, you can, there's three levels of the engine in terms of sophistication, but all are you know, inexpensive. You can do hundreds of queries for less than a dollar total. But mm -hmm. as that starts to get ramped up, I think first people that signed up, they got like 15 or $13 in terms of cash to use, but uh, the application of that is quite good. And if they can save people hours a day towards what they're trying to do, that's some right. pretty deep utility. So, I mean, you're the AI professor and I'm just roundly um, fascinated by it, but did it just kind of come out of nowhere? Or you, do you see similar entrance to the space that we're uh, well, I have, a, I have a PhD student that I'm working with I'm his, on his committee, and he's rom in Romance languages, and he's from Columbia, South America, and he studies, um, I should know the name of the author, uh, but he studies this um, author that is oh, kind of almost like a, uh, almost like a Harry Potter, you know, magical fantasy type of stuff where, you know, you might be walking along doing your own thing and then some sort of magic happens. So I don't really understand it and I don't, you know, read enough Spanish to know, <clears throat> but he's used that uh, to, to um, input um, this kind of genre and had it write new pieces. And so, um, and you know, he's probably spent $20 or something. It's just amazing when you think about compute cycles, how uh, cheap it is. Um, but he's been doing that for his research. So I knew this was possible uh, if you had the time to train it. But I, it was, took me by surprise at here's something that's been trained on the internet and can do all this. And uh, I provide you an example on one of your posts, uh, uh, your newsletter. I'll post those down on the YouTube recording. Um, because uh, you wrote about this recently, that I have a reflection paper that I often assign to my large classes, and it's just like a page. We grade it pass fail because we don't have time to mark up, you know, 400 different uh, papers, and uh, we just kind of look at it. Okay, this person read it. They got the. They watched the documentary, or they you know read this text and they understand it. Move on to the next one. Well, I just put in a couple prompts into a GPT chat and it came back with a passable paper. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to do this as an experiment the first week of class is I'm gonna have all 400 students make a, uh, uh, a, a paper using a prompt and we're gonna see if we can train an AI to detect patterns there. But uh, you're right about writing programs. I asked one, uh, I asked it to create a program to calculate the position of Mars. And it said, well, I can't really do that, but here's all the steps you would need to do that. And so it at least gives you like, oh, okay, well, now I know what I need to do, right? And that's the other thing you're talking about, just automation. You know, I've got a lot of things that um, are kind of what sometimes referred to uh, uh, as duct tape work, right? So. One information system doesn't talk with another. So I got to go copy from this thing and paste it over here in the university's information system. And there's nobody that's incentivized to tie these two things together because these people manage this system and these people manage this system. And I'm the poor bastard that has to tie it all together with 20 minutes of my time. Well, of course, if it's going to be two hours of my time, I'm like, okay, let's write a Python script. Let's get this, you know, uh, I'm not that good at writing python scripts so it takes you know there has to be some payoff there it's going to be larger but there's a lot of little things like that i'm like why doesn't my computer say hey scott i noticed you're doing some repetitive duct taping here why don't i just take that over for you and it seems like this is the sort of thing if that was built into the operating system where you could say hey i want you to transfer all these names and emails and I need you to reverse the names, you know, the first and last name, and then you need to look up student numbers over here, and then I need you to, you know, take this action. Um, 
you know, you could write a prompt for how to do that and probably, I don't know, three minutes, get the prompt right, let it test it out a couple times. Um, so yeah, for Microsoft, um, uh, and, and you know, that's why Google has raised alarms, I guess, inside of Google is that, oh, I'm not, I don't need to Google something and then go read something how to do it. I'll just tell the computer to do that. <laughs> you know? So instead of searching for how to repair, you know, the, uh, what did I repair the other day? Uh, the dryer. So I had a certain model dryer. And so, we're, of course, I go on YouTube, find the video of how to repair the dryer, watch, have to watch the video, then take my, you know, uh, iPad down by the dryer, with my uh, uh, screwdriver, and, and do the work all over again that this guy's done. Well, instead, I could just ask, how do I repair the temperature sensor in this particular model? Well, here's, here's the five steps. Go get started. Um, so yeah, I'm. Uh, it really took me by surprise. And um, the problem, uh, I think I uh, mentioned to you that there's an article this morning that uh, a professor, it was in New York Post, so not exactly mainstream, kind of tabloidish um, uh, paper, but he was talking about how he failed a student because they used GPT chat to write their paper. And this is apparently a small class where he got to know the students. Okay, this doesn't seem right uh, in front of the student. And the student said, yeah, he'd used this tool. Um, and I think some of my colleagues here, I've sent them all a note. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, you know, it sounds like we can detect it, so it's not a problem. <laughs> but like you said two years ago, you know, 24 months ago, we were like, oh, yeah, this is total crap, making fun of it. Today we're aghast. Well, guess what? It's going to be in two years from now. We aren't going to know that that's done by, it's going to have perfect APA style citations. It's going to have all this other stuff. These things grow at such a geometric rate that, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's, you know, got some great applications, but it's kind of scary too, so. Do you think that, like, a, what OpenAI is doing is more interesting to you, or like what Boston Dynamics is doing with their robots that are having a lot of the same, um, capabilities of humans in terms of being able to interact in the, the physical world? Well, um, we actually have, I think, four or five uh, of those robots here on campus now. Not, they're not all on campus. It's in a project with um, uh, Ameren Electric because they have a nuclear power plant nearby and want to see about using those for security and for going into places that you don't want to stay a long time if you're a, a human, so for remote inspection. Um, I think those are going to have more limited utility. I think it's kind of going to be like uh, autonomous systems where we see with self-driving cars. We've got a, a hundred billion has been spent on self-driving cars and uh, they still can't really make, really make left-hand turns, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think, uh, you know, some of those autonomous systems are going to have these niche applications where, um, you know, like I think mining, agriculture, they're going to have autonomous, you know, John Deere already has autonomous tractors. Um, so you're going to see that deployed um, well before uh, we see anything with cars. I think these robots are going to have uh, certain utility in construction, inspection, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe in some horrible ways too, like warfare, you know, um, but um, I don't see that um, as, as much of a threat to like jobs and to trust as technologies like GPT chat. Um, so that's kind of where I said, what do you think? I think exactly as you say that the jobs for the longest time, you know, the narrative in the States would be that blue collar jobs may leave, but white collar are here to stay because we're a service-based economy. And with many of these processes, some of those processes can be uh, redundant. And so uh, it, it could be a game changer, but to the degree that um, there's still problems with it or functions need to be, or things need to be done outside of the ordinary scope of what can be defined. Um, yeah, I don't think that it'll be as disruptive as the alarmists are sounding, but uh, 
like you say, it's a different applicability of what a good defense contractor is trying to do versus what AI is trying to do, you know, facing the entire public. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I've been learning more about and trying to educate myself more about is demographics. So here in the US, we're going to have a labor shortage for a long period of time, and many Western countries will. So I think these technologies will probably be embraced by um, Western countries because it's going to solve problems and they are going to be jobs, service jobs that have to get done that cannot be turned over to a robot. You know, when I'm in the old folks home, uh, <clears throat> I don't want, you know, the Boston Dynamics uh, trying to put me to bed at night or something like that. Um, and uh, so I think there's certain things that are going to have to be done by humans, but there's a lot of processes that can be re-engineered so they don't need humans. So McDonald's launched a basically a completely automatic McDonald's, and uh, it's been argued that, oh, well, you wouldn't ever replace McDonald's folks with a robot because flipping burgers is such a dext you know, dexterous activity. Well, you don't really need to flip them. You just re-engineer the process for how they get cooked, right? And so <laughs> you don't really, um, you know, have to mimic the exact human, uh, you know, mechanics of all that. But uh, I think that you're going to see other countries where they're going to, so Africa has huge, uh, it's the one place that stands out as far as large population growth and unfortunately relatively little investment, um, a lot of corruption that's gone on, so relatively little investment in education. Whereas, you know, India and China, you see a population, uh, China's probably peaked right now and it's going to start going down. But uh, in India, you do see they've had massive investments in uh, education along the way. So I think um, if you're bringing uh, automated uh, tractors to the U.S., you're probably going to do fine. If you are trying to bring them to Nigeria, they're probably going to, you know, bust your tractor up into a thousand pieces, uh, and and probably rightfully so because um, right now there's not that kind of labor shortage there. So I think demographics are actually going to play more significant role in how this gets adopted by different countries. Um, we're actually seeing like South Korea and Japan, you know, have been on this trajectory for quite some time to have very low population growth. And, uh, you know, that's going to be difficult for them to overcome. Some of the biggest or most um, active critics of the AI are artists. So here in LA, you know, you have visual artists that have put 10 years in their craft and the um, you know, open AI can do a good job with the rendering or a lot of these tools can make visually stunning just based on a text command. And what I tell these artists is that you just have to have people connected to you as a person that's creating it, like create a narrative and a brand around what you're trying to do, kind of like people did. So like, you know, Mike Winkleman talking about his journey of doing one a day and then his um, leanings towards different types of government and like people you can get more visually arresting images elsewhere but people are invested in him as the creator of that so right to the degree that like their skill set has been negated by that it's um you know it, it's not necessarily kind of so right it's just a, a different dynamic that's um creating a visual medium based on specific parameters well, um, any big predictions for 23? I think next year we'll see a continued push with DAOs being used as a governance tool uh, on chain. I think there's a possibility that retail adoption will continue to, um, to grow in the countries that don't have the formal built out financial systems, but perhaps stateside like a year of not much upward movement in terms of cryptocurrency prices just because of the interest rates being high and a lot of these cryptos being traded alongside growth stocks so it could be that we end this next december and bitcoin's still under twenty thousand. but i do see the continued uptick on institutional DeFi led by jp morgan you know jamie Dimon famously flipped on bitcoin from the beginning and now he's one of the biggest um, trumpeters of a lot of these technologies, you know, under his permission blockchain and, you know, walled right. garden approach, but that I think will be big. And I think that there's a real possibility that SEC drops the hammer on the permissibility of anything that mirrors a security. So that would allow for more difficult um, security token conversations or even any sort of stateside 
cryptocurrency angles. But I think the centralization for or away from dApps or individual players towards Coinbase and Gemini and people that have checked all the boxes from the regulatory perspective will benefit them. And I also think about the bridge out to the Web3 world. You could see MetaMask and the Trust Wallet with Binance or Coinbase's wallet. Like People will be so distrustful of the phishing attacks and all of the vulnerabilities that are out in the wild that they're just they won't access any sort of dApps or applications outside of a wallet. So um, security will continue to be an issue with the upgrades on bridges and uh, porting from chain to chain um, and then upgrades. So like uh, the upgrades have always been a problem. And I'm also looking to see with the enforcement, you probably saw with Mango that they're arresting one of the people that did a trade on their protocol and he was being arrested in the same way that the person that's the founder of Tornado was um, being sought by uh, law enforcement because they saw that significant amounts of uh, North Korean traffic was being over there and various assets were being mixed that were being hacked. So continued clamp down on the retail front, continued adoption on the institutional front and centralization among the powers and hopefully that'll get Coinbase back to profitability. <laughs> right. Yeah, I am. Uh, I think uh, I would predict, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think regula regulation on stable coin and uh, exchanges will be the first action. I think exchanges first, uh, just because of FTX, the fallout from all that. Um, and I think uh, that is going to lead to some good things. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, I've, I lived through the 80s, the PC revolution, and then the internet, and people always compare this to, you know, oh, well, it's complicated now, you know, that was, you know, like the internet was in the 90s. I'm like, well, I think we need to go back a decade, because <laughs> it's really more like it was in the late 80s, where you had, I built my first modem. So, you know, so in 85, I built a modem. <laughs> because I wanted to be able to do stuff, cobbled it together, and then made the long distance charges, you know, to uh, actually call another computer. So um, I think it's just uh, a lot of these things, especially NFTs, uh, Ethereum, um, I just think it's going to be a long winter, you know, and it's going to be another five years. But I think, you know, there's some really smart people working on this stuff. They're going to have some need applications. Um, I think that, uh, you know, like I said, I'm bullish on the long run, but I probably think the long run is, you know, five years out uh, from now. Um, I hope uh, that the Ukrainian conflict comes to an end, you know, uh, hopefully by the first, uh, uh, hopefully by summer, you know, it's going to be a long, muddy, uh, wet winter uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, that's going to slow everything down, but uh, maybe Putin will will fall down the stairs like his uh, or fall out a window like his oligarchs seem to be doing on a daily basis, um, and uh, that will have bolster the economy and I think lift everybody's mood uh, across all sectors. So that's that's um, hopefully by May if we see the end of that conflict, we'll see a kind of re renewed optimism. Um, I am still a little bit worried about how much venture capital money is out there because it still seems just too frothy. Um, some of the things that I see getting funded and not necessarily in crypto or or anything. Um, it seems like there's just still some people have just a little bit too much money or something. Um, and uh, some of these ideas that are probably not worthwhile are, are getting uh, funded. But uh, well, thank you so much, Robert, for joining me today. And uh, Pablo, thanks for joining alive and for your question. And um, I'll stop the recording here and uh, we'll put all the contact information below on the YouTube channel. And, and uh, uh, thank you uh, so much.